Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am Dr. Amna Sajay from the Department of Biochemistry and today we are going to introduce proteins and discuss the biomedical significance of proteins. These are the learning objectives. Now you must have heard the word proteins many times in your life. So what basically are proteins? The word protein is derived from a word proteos which means the first or the supreme and proteins have been named so because at the time of their discovery they were thought to be the most important biological compounds because of their contribution in growth and maintenance of tissues. So what are proteins? Proteins are, I beg your pardon, proteins are biological polymers comprising of one or more polypeptide chains that consist of amino acids. So these proteins are basically macromolecules. These are in fact polymers that comprise of amino acids and amino acids which are the building blocks of proteins, they connect together via covalent bonds known as peptide bonds and by linking together they form polypeptide chains and these polypeptide chains are found in the structure of proteins. Each protein may contain one polypeptide chain or it may contain more than one polypeptide chains and in case of presence of multiple polypeptide chains in a protein molecule, these chains interact and associate with each other in different ways and conformations to give rise to the final product which is the protein. So in summary, amino acids are the building blocks or the constituent monomers of polypeptide chains and these polypeptide chains make up a protein and each protein may either contain one polypeptide chain or it may contain more than one polypeptide chains. Now this figure shows the structure of an amino acid. As you can see there is one carbon atom at the center and this carbon atom is known as alpha carbon atom and it is bonded to a carboxyl group and an amino group and it is also bonded to a hydrogen atom and to an R group. Now this R group is known as the variable group because it can vary from one amino acid to the other and it is because of the presence of this R group that specific unique properties are possessed by different kinds of amino acids. For example, uh, amino acids may be neutral in nature, they may be basic in nature or they may be acidic in nature and all these different properties are being imparted by this side chain which is represented by R in this figure. Now <clears throat> as I discussed earlier amino acids link together via covalent bonds known as peptide bonds. Now this figure shows the formation of a peptide bond which is nothing but the removal of water molecule from carboxylic group of one amino acid and amino group of another amino acid. This amino acid is giving its hydrogen atom and this is giving its, giving its hydroxyl group resulting in the removal of water molecule and the resultant bond between this carbon and this nitrogen is known as the peptide bond through which these two amino acids are now linked. Now, so this figure shows that during peptide bond formation the carboxylic group of one amino acid and the amino group of the other amino acid are contributing. Now this figure shows a polypeptide chain which is made up of multiple amino acids. These amino acids are linked together by peptide bonds and as a result of this linkage a polypeptide chain is formed. Now I will move on to the biomedical importance of different types of proteins. Now as you may know that there are two major classes of proteins based on their structure. One is fibrous proteins and the other is globular proteins. So I will discuss 
first the biomedical importance of fibrous proteins and then move on to the globular proteins as the name indicates fibrous proteins are those proteins which are in the form of fibers or fibrils or they are elongated in shape uh, first example of fibrous protein that we will discuss is collagen now collagen is a very important protein that is found in our body in fact it is the most abundant protein present in the human body because it is found in the connective tissue in a wide in a wide variety of tissues such as skin bone tendon blood vessels basement membrane etc and what is the function of collagen collagen has a very unique rigid structure due to which it gives tensile strength to the connective tissue wherever it is present and tensile strength means that the tissue where collagen is going to be present is going to be very resistant to breaking by external forces so this is a very important property that is being imparted by collagen to the different connective tissues now this figure shows a collagen molecule which is in the form of a triple helix now what does triple helix means this is a collagen molecule in the form of a triple helix triple helix means that there are three polypeptide chains which are wound around each other in the form of a helix so collagen molecules are basically triple helices now these collagen molecules or triple helices can either arrange themselves in the form of fibrils leading to the formation of fibril forming collagen or they can arrange themselves in the form of a three dimensional network or meshwork known as network forming collagen now fibril forming collagen as you can see is found in a variety of tissues such as skin bone tendon blood vessels cornea cartilage intervertebral disc vitreous body and fetal skin whereas network forming Uh, collagen is found in the basement membrane of epithelial cells where th this type of collagen is providing mechanical support to the adjacent epithelial cells now there is also a third type of cartilage uh, sorry collagen known as fibril associated collagen now fibril associated collagen means that this type of collagen will be found in, on the surface of fibril forming collagen and what is the function of this type of collagen it links the different fibrils with one another and also with other components of the extracellular matrix and in this way it serves to strengthen the connective tissue even more it imparts even greater tensile strength to the connective tissue now i will move on to collagenopathies collagenopathies means there is some defect in either the synthesis or the metabolism of collagen the first uh, disorder that i am going to discuss is known as scurvy you might have heard of this disorder it is basically caused by deficiency of a very important vitamin known as vitamin c so what is the relationship between vitamin c and collagen now vitamin c is basically acting as a coenzyme during hydroxylation reactions that are play, uh, taking place during synthesis of collagen and when vitamin c will be uh, deficient it won't be able to act as a coenzyme during those important hydroxylation reactions resulting in formation of defective collagen therefore most of the symptoms of scurvy that are observed they are happening due to presence of defective collagen in different connective tissues around the body uh, such symptoms include swollen spongy bleeding gums delayed wound healing and bleeding into the skin and easy bruising all these symptoms can be attributed to uh, defective collagen present in uh, the connective tissue found at these sites now this picture shows the spongy swollen gums that are a characteristic of uh, patient suffering from scurvy 
Now, another disorder that is uh, linked with collagen is known as osteogenesis imperfecta. Osteogenesis imperfecta is also known as brittle bone disease and it is named so because it is characterized by bones that fracture easily and it is caused by mutations in genes which are coding for collagen polypeptide chains. So there is defective uh, synthesis of collagen polypeptide chains that is affecting the main function of collagen which is providing tensile strength to connective tissue and as it cannot impart the adequate amount of tensile strength to bones they are fragile in nature. Now the phenotypic severity in case of osteogenesis imperfecta it varies from mild to lethal. Now type 1 which is the most common form of this disorder is although it is also the mildest form of osteogenesis imperfecta and it is characterized by mild bone fragility, hearing loss and blue sclera. On the other hand, type 2 osteogenesis imperfecta is the most severe form of this disorder and it is usually not compatible with life and results in deaths during the perinatal period. Okay, now we move on to the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or EDS. Now EDS is also a collagenopathy and it is basically a heterogeneous group of connective tissue disorders. It is called a heterogeneous group of connective tissue disorders because EDS is associated with multiple pathological causes resulting in multiple phenotypes. For example, EDS can result from either defective synthesis of collagen or it may result from defective metabolism of fibrillar collagen. For example, in one form of EDS, there may be changes to the amino acid sequence of the polypeptide chains and in another form, the enzymes which are responsible for the metabolism of fibrillar collagen such as lysyl hydroxylase, they may be deficient. So there may be different causes, there are different causes of EDS and different causes result in different phenotypic variations. Now the classic form of EDS is characterized by skin extensibility and fragility and joint hypermobility as can be seen in this figure. You uh, can see in a patient of classic EDS there is presence of stretchy extensible skin. Now I am going to discuss the role of elastin which is another fibrous protein and it is also found in connective tissue. But in stark contrast to collagen which was, which is a rigid uh, fibrous protein that imparts, uh, imparts tensile strength to connective tissue, elastin has rubber like properties such as elasticity. In fact, it is named elastin because of its elastic nature. Now, elastin is present in elastic fibers that are a part of lungs, walls of large arteries and elastic ligaments and these elastic fibers are composed of elastin molecules which are deposited on specific glycoprotein microfibrils known such as fibrillin. So fibrillin which is a glycoprotein it will be present and on fibrillin elastic elastin molecules will be deposited resulting in the formation of elastic fibers that are a part of lungs, walls of large arteries and elastic ligaments. Now the elastic rubber like properties of elastin are due to the presence of extensive interconnection between the elastin molecules which have been deposited on fibrillin and these interconnections between elastin molecules are known as desmosine cross links and because of this extensive interconnection between the elastin molecules, elastin, presence, uh, elastin possesses rubber-like 
properties and it can be bent and stretched in any direction when a force is applied and when that force is removed it will recoil back to its original shape and all this is possible due to the presence of desmosine cross links between different elastin molecules and this cross linking is extensive okay now i will discuss marfan syndrome which is caused by mutations in the gene that code for fibrillin 1 protein and fibrillin protein as you may recall is the glycoprotein on which elastin molecules are deposited now marfan syndrome is characterized by impaired structural integrity in the skeleton eyes and cvs Now this figure shows the hands of a patient who is suffering from Marfan syndrome. As you can see, the patient is exhibiting joint hypermobility and his fingers are long and spindly in shape. This is a characteristic of Marfan syndrome, long spindly fingers. Okay, now I will discuss the role of another fibrous protein known as keratin and most of you might have heard of keratin before because it is abundantly present in skin, hair and nails where it is providing not only structural support but also uh, performing a protective function. Now keratin is also found in animals and birds in horns, hooves, wool and feathers now this uh, is the structure of skin and as you can see on the surface of the skin there is a layer of keratin which is not only providing structural support but also performing a protective function this outermost layer on the skin is formed by keratin now what is the importance of actin and myosin proteins now actin and myosin proteins are also fibrous proteins and they are involved in the contraction of different types of muscles so in other words we can say that actin and myosin are contractile proteins Now this was all about the biomedical importance of fibrous proteins. Now we are going to discuss the role of globular proteins. Now perhaps the most commonly known globular protein is hemoglobin. Now what is the function of hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is found in erythrocytes or red blood cells and basically hemoglobin is responsible for the red color that is seen in blood and what is the role of hemoglobin it carries oxygen from the lungs to the tissues where this oxygen is used for aerobic uh, respiration and it then binds carbon dioxide which is being produced in the tissues and transports it to the lungs from where carbon dioxide can be expelled so hemoglobin has two main functions it transports oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and transports carbon dioxide being produced in the tissues to the lungs from where carbon dioxide can be expelled now albumin is another very important globular protein and uh, why is it so important because serum albumin is a significant modulator of plasma oncotic pressure now what is meant by plasma oncotic pressure this is basically the osmotic pressure which is being exerted by plasma proteins in the blood now most of this pro, uh, plasma oncotic pressure is due to the presence of serum albumin in the absence or in uh, case of low serum albumin levels then plasma oncotic pressure levels drop resulting in the leakage of water out of the blood and into the neighboring tissues which is clinically manifested as 
edema so adequate serum albumin levels are very important for retaining water inside the blood otherwise it will move out of the blood and it will leak into the neighboring tissues and will cause edema as can be seen in different disorders such as liver disorder because liver is the primary site of albumin synthesis and in case of some liver disorder the synthesis of albumin is decreased resulting in hypoalbuminemia or in other words low serum albumin levels and this ultimately causes edema now apart from its uh, function as a significant modulator of plasma on cortic pressure albumin serum albumin also binds and transports a wide variety of substances such as bilirubin ions fatty acids and drugs by binding to these uh, most of these substances it renders them water soluble okay now i am going to discuss the role of globulins in our body now there are a number of globulins which are present in our circulation but i am only going to discuss just a few examples okay some of these names you might have come across earlier and some names you will come across in subsequent lectures now the first example of globulins that i am going to discuss is heptoglobin now heptoglobin is a protein which can bind free hemoglobin and can transport it to the reticular endothelial cells where this free hemoglobin can be degraded and iron can be released and salvaged for a uh, reutilization in red blood cell synthesis so in the absence of this transport protein for free, free hemoglobin the iron contained in that free hemoglobin will be lost and cannot be reutilized for red blood cell synthesis in addition uh, to binding free hemoglobin heptoglobin also possesses antibacterial and antioxidant properties now another example of globulins is ceruloplasmin you must might have heard about ceruloplasmin before we will discuss it later while discussing copper metabolism but and iron metabolism as well but uh, you need to remember that ceruloplasmin is the major copper carrying protein in the blood and in addition it also possesses enzymatic activity as it is a ferrooxidase enzyme that is it is capable of converting the ferrous or fe2 positive form of iron to its ferric or fe3 positive form so because of its uh, ferrooxidase activity ceruloplasmin is also involved in iron metabolism now the third example of globulins is thyroxine binding globulin as is indicated by the name this protein binds hormones that are released from the thyroid t3 and T4 and T4 is basically thyroxine. So thyroxine binding globulin binds and transports thyroid hormones in the blood. Another example of globulins is protein C. As you might have uh, studied while studying clotting mechanisms, protein C is a very important inhibitor of coagulation found in blood. Now. transferrin again is a globulin and it is a transport or carrier protein for iron that is it transports iron in the blood now what are gamma globulins gamma globulins are also known as immunoglobulins or antibodies and they are produced from plasma cells and plasma cells differentiate from b lymphocytes and these immunoglobulins represent a very major component of adaptive and innate immunity against a number of substances and organisms okay now i will discuss the role of proteins as enzymes so you must know what is meant by the term enzymes enzymes are basically catalysts biological catalysts that are speeding up the rate of different chemical reactions in our body and it is important to remember that almost all reactions that are taking place in our body they are be being catalyzed by enzymes and these enzymes are protein in nature there are a multiple a uh, number of enzymes that are present in our body and they are performing varied functions i have included just a few examples alanine transaminase sorry this is aminase 
alkaline phosphatase, lactate dehydrogenase and hexokinase enzymes. Again these are just a few examples, there are a number of different enzymes performing different functions in our body. Now the role of peptide hormones. So in our blood again there are a number of hormones that are circulating and out of these uh, some hormones are peptide in nature such as insulin, glucagon, calcitonin, ACTH and gastrin and they are performing different functions in our body such as insulin and glucagon are involved in glucose metabolism, calcitonin in, is involved in calcium homeostasis, ACTH is involved in stimulating adrenal cortex to produce cortisol, gastrin stimulates parietal cells in the stomach to produce hydrochloric acid and it also increases gastric mobility. Again there are many other uh, hormones which are peptide in nature but I have only included just a few examples. Okay, now I am going to discuss the importance of histone proteins. Now histone proteins are a group of basic proteins that carry a positive charge and they can interact with the neg negatively charged DNA molecules and uh, these histone proteins are involved in wrapping of DNA around them and in this way long DNA molecules can be accommodating uh, can be accommodated inside the small nucleus. So the major role of histone proteins is a wrapping of DNA due to which long DNA molecules can be packaged or uh, accommodated inside the nucleus. Now what is the role of proteins in energy production? Now proteins can be used for in energy production only under special circumstances when there is limited availability of carbohydrates and fats for this purpose. That is they are third in line for energy production after carbohydrates and fats and one gram of protein is equivalent to four calories. So this was all about the biomedical importance of proteins. Uh, hope to see you in the next lecture. You can uh, ask any uh, queries related to this lecture through email. Thank you.